Welcome to HHE Podcast. The Verdict. This is our after show podcast where we look back at the most recent episode, number 74, Nine Lives in Bangladesh during the Victorian era. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and check it out, or else there will be spoilers ahead. Did you know most mammals take 20 seconds to evacuate their bladder? Hello, my name is Ryan Weir, and I'm here in the HHE studio with the catnip to my kitty litter. It's Mr. Peter Goddard. I am like crack to the cat. (laughs) And we are joined as ever by the Duke of Death Defying Distectophobes. It's the judge himself. It's Mr. Paul Dursley. Uh, Good evening. Now, Peter, you're going to have to forgive me, but my homemade parachute failed to open after I was pushed off a rooftop (laughs) recently, and now I've forgotten everything about the last episode, so would you mind reminding me in, let's say, I don't know, 60 seconds or thereabouts? Sounds like an unfortunate accident, definitely an accident, Mm. but of course I will. When would you like me to do that? Do it now! I took us to South Asia, to Bangladesh, the green and low-lying, unfortunately floodable country that is home to the Bengal tiger and brightly painted rickshaws. We took on the challenge of nine lives and discovered three remarkable Bangladeshis. Lalon Shah, a ball, which is kind of a wandering minstrel philosopher, Begum Rakaya, feminist writer and sci-fi author, and Jagadish Chandra Bose, the physicist who made great strides in radio waves and who refused to patent his many inventions. We toasted these three characters who represented the three stages of nine lives, one who played, one who strayed, and one who stayed. Last week's episode done, summarised nicely, nice one son, now we're over to a young Dursley who's gonna tell you what he thought of me, he'll take you apart without any care, he's the lovely Paul Dursley, the lovely Paul Dursley. Ah, yes, I remember it all now, and what a show it was, Pete. A true HHE podcast, filled to the brim with facts, trivia, and fascinating stories about lesser-known people from history. But what does it matter what I think? Absolutely nothing. We are here for the opinion of just one man, Judge Dursley. So, Paul, before we convene the court and receive your final ruling, please give us your first impressions of episode 74. There were some serious factual errors. Oh, Oh, that's not a strong start. That's uh, a real worry. Well, I can cop to one of them right off the bat if that helps. I don't think it will help, but I will uh, cop to it nevertheless. I said that one of the Bangladeshi authors, who was in fact the writer of the national anthem, Rabindranath Tagore, was the first non-European winner of a Nobel Prize. I misspoke. Oh dear. He was the second non-European winner of a Nobel Prize, but the first non-European winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. I always forget that. They always do little those little categories for the Nobel Prize. We always talk about, oh, they won the Nobel Prize, like it's just one prize, but there's lots of them, right? Five, I think. Yeah, I think it's because you, you're normally talking about what they've done, so you've sort of implied it by the time you get to saying they've got the, the Nobel Prize. Very few people, were, you go, oh, this guy invented the Higgs boson. He won the Nobel Prize for literature. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a Nobel Prize for podcasting, though? Not yet, but of course, I'm fairly confident that uh, if there were to be one, we would definitely be on our way to Norway, is it? As we speak. Depends on what it is. Most of them are in Sweden, but peace is Norway. Sounds like you know a lot about Nobel Prizes there, Paul. Are you hankering for a Nobel? No, I I, I don't know anything about them, apart from, you know, what a normal intelligent person would know. Oh dear. that's, That's us out then. But while we're talking about Rabindranath Tagore, I've got a few extra bits because I did kind of want to talk about him. But he was actually from Calcutta, which was made in Bengali, but not Bangladeshi. And I was really trying to maintain a a people from Bangladesh focus for the episode. Otherwise, it all became a bit general Indian history and general Indian people. Yeah. But uh, Tagore apparently wrote his first poetry at the age of eight. Yeah, but I wrote poetry at the age of eight. (laughs) There once was a man from Kentucky. (laughs) Well, in this case, there once was a man from Calcutta. You can take it from there. Yeah. (laughs) Who smothered his balls with butter. (laughs) You shouldn't have said that now, because this whole thing I'm just going to be thinking about. Another Nobel is coming your way. You've got the physics wrapped up. Now you're going for literature, I can see. But anyway, he was said to have started writing at the age of eight. He continued writing, apparently as well 
well as the Bangladeshi national anthem, he's said to have inspired, or some people even say wrote, the Singapore national anthem as well. This guy was really doing the anthems. But apparently he wrote about 2,230 songs, which is fairly impressive, but might just stick with just the best of Tagore, right? Yes, because that, that's unusual, isn't it? Because that, that national anthem is a waltz, and there aren't that many waltzes and national anthems. Yeah, I realised that after I was listening back to the episode. I'm like, oh, it's a waltz. No wonder I was thinking it was so swinging and nice and had a sort of bandstand feel to it. Because funnily enough, the British national anthem and the Liechtenstein national anthem and the former Prussian national anthem and the Norwegian royal anthem are all waltzes. Yeah, we had two waltzes in that episode because we also played the UK national anthem. Yes, that was one of the things I need to take Peter to task on. Oh. Sh- should we move on straight into me getting roasted? <laughs> I feel it's coming. I'd rather just get it over and done with. Let's do it. I want to hear it. Let's roast Pete. Hit the sting. You're going to make a whole sting for this, aren't I you? I am. I am, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, Peter, Peter got it wrong. 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 Well, first, first of all, I, I think there was another one. We'll start with the minor one. I don't think Delhi was the capital of India. Calcutta was the capital of India for a long period of time. I'll accept that. Ha! <laughs> you are so wrong. And the first major thing was the little skit about the independence of India slash Pakistan slash East Pakistan was, you said, Queen Victoria. I didn't think she was alive in 1947. Oh. I'm, I'm going to say I'm not sure the sketches are, <laughs> are expected to be no, fully... No, I, I think it is, Pete. I think it's all part of it. OK, OK. And on a related note, can you please tell me the dates of the Victorian era? Yeah, I have to really cop to this one. I'm, they go to 1901. <laughs> yes! Wait a minute! This can came in so early in the episode, I had to put a little text in to say, Pete has made an enormous gaffe and I'm, we're only 10 minutes in or something. Yeah. yeah. What was my response? Lol. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, there may have been mistakes in exactly boundarying the Victorian era, <laughs> but only by a handful of years. So I think the history was sufficiently interesting and the years sufficiently accommodating to make it okay. But yes, that was... That was a factual error yes that was a boo-boo anyway i hope you enjoyed the stories thank you bye so i'm confused which of the old stories didn't fit in the time period well the first story that begum rakea published was in 1905 so she had grown up and started writing by 1901 but actually when she blossomed it was slightly after our period I mean, it's slightly out of the period. I don't care whether it's in or out of the period. This, the, the, I care that the fact that he said the Victorian era yeah. was 1837, he said, to 1905. And that is patently incorrect. But her presence <laughs> lingered for many years after her death. And people felt Victorian even for up to seven years after she passed. Hey, we're not in the plea yet, Mr. <laughs> Goddard. You can save that for the plea. Oh, dear. OK, <laughs> carry on. Anything else I've done horribly wrong? <laughs> well, the nine lives, sort of cutting it back to three, was a bit... I have to, I, I have to defend myself on the grounds of artistic integrity here. I, it was a bit, but also my original plan to do nine lives was so boring that I thought I'm going to have to, for the audience, for the sake of the audience, I'm going to fall on my sword and do something more interesting i'm I'm gonna say that i liked it actually but I've, I've got to say pete i'm looking forward to the verdict for this episode yeah i can see why you might feel that way ryan and i thank you for your concern So, Ryan, you're going to love this next bit. Am I? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I made another mistake. <laughs> oh, no. Let me play the sting. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, Peter, Peter got it wrong. 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 
Ouija got it wrong. It wasn't really a mistake. It was a speculation that was incorrect, I think it's fair to say. Ryan, you said what happened to Clive of India, and I said he probably died going, hurrah, look at all my money, and was super wealthy and had a great time. Yeah. Didn't he try and shoot himself? Well, not quite, but it was a similarly tragic end. So what, just sort of whistle-stop tour. On his third tour in India, Clive apparently tried to reform the East India Company, but he wasn't very successful. He comes back to England. In 1772, Parliament opened an inquiry into the East India Company's practices. Is this the Warren Hastings thing? Yes, exactly, which uh, hopefully we'll cover in another episode. But basically, Clive's political opponents took this opportunity to basically just lay into Clive and just make him look bad. So Clive defends his looting of India, saying, I stand astonished at my own moderation. I.e., basically, I've plundered the place dry, but I could have taken a bit more (laughs) if I had wanted. Oh, wow. Okay. So anyway, he backs himself. He closes his testimony by saying, take my fortune, but save my honour. And the vote that followed that uh, actually exonerated Clive. So he kind of comes away scot-free on the parliamentary side. But on uh, the 22nd of November, 1774, Clive died. He was aged 49. He was living in Berkeley Square, which is in London. And his death was caused by a cut to his throat from a penknife that he held himself. So this is a very peculiar way of saying, basically, he cut his own throat, right? There wow. Was, there was no inquest carried out. Contemporary newspapers reported his death as due to a fit or a stroke. So he's accidentally somehow stabbed himself in the throat with a penknife. There was no suicide note, but Samuel Johnson wrote, he had acquired his fortune by such crimes that his consciousness of them impelled him to cut his own throat. So he may or may not have committed suicide. We're not 100% sure. I think I've seen more places say he committed suicide than otherwise, but because partly also he had a history of depression. He was addicted to opium, partly because he took it for the pain that he had for health issues that he had as well. So he had pain, depression, drug addiction, and he cuts his own throat. So I said he died happy as Larry, or I speculated rather, but actually no, it was quite a tragic end for Clive of India. Oh wow! Because I'm I'm sure I can I I can remember that it was obviously to do with the depression. He tried to shoot himself, and the gun misfired or or whatever, and he sort of took it as a sign and went off to India. But oh wow! So he had a history of it, perhaps. Well, going to India was semi suicidal as well, because although you could make your fortune tremendously, and that's what attracted people, I think it was I forget the exact figure, but it was somewhere around like one in four or one in three people who joined the East India Company at the beginning died. So you had a really solid chance of being deceased before you were rich. But if you didn't die, you would also be rich. What would you have died from? Sort of dysentery and... There's diseases, there's... Malaria. Every, everything. Angry sepoys at various states. My goodness. Well, there you go. I feel slightly bad about the way we spoke of Clive there. Well, I mean, he did still end up super wealthy and he was responsible for the horrors of uh, Bengal. So I think it's still fair to think on balance he's considered a net negative in the history of the world. Yeah. How strange. Killing yourself with a penknife. There you go. I I can tell you something that you got right. Yes, please do. (laughs) I don't have a sting for that. (laughs) (laughs) You were talking about the the border between India and Bangladesh, and that that was that is always fascinating because it was only resolved, I think, sometime last decade, sometime in the twenty tens. But the way the boundary was drawn around there, there were loads of enclaves and exclaves of bits of India were inside bits of Bangladesh and bits of Bangladesh were inside bits of India. And there was one case where there was a bit of India inside a bit of Bangladesh, which itself was inside a bit of India, which itself was inside a bit of Bangladesh. And this situation stayed until the sort of the mid 2010s. So the the boundary, you could argue, was incredibly long because it had all of these enclaves and counter enclaves. And as I said, it was only recently that they decided to say, sod it, let's just work out what the difference is and just exchange the the requisite amount of territory. We can only imagine the people of the area are very accustomed to carrying their passport just in case they have to travel across <laughs> yeah. another country. Yeah, how about that? It's the only example of a third level enclave, but it doesn't exist anymore. So I think there are only two second level enclaves left 
the, the most recent example is closer to home, um, which is in Belgium and the Netherlands. There's a place called Baal Nassau and Baal Herzog, which is effectively the same village, but different streets in this village are in different countries. And I think there's even a house where some rooms are in one country and some rooms in another. So it <laughs> still exists. That's amazing. Just going to go to the bathroom. Can you hand me my passport? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, gosh, I don't want to answer the question. What's the nature of your visit? <laughs> 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 Don't worry, there's nothing to declare. <laughs> <laughs> So, I would like to talk cats. Please do. So, I'd like to talk cats because we spoke about the Bengal tiger. Mm. Yeah, well, the Bengal tiger is one of eight wild cats in Bangladesh. Isn't that the largest cat? And it is the largest cat. Yeah, they can reach up to 2.7 metres long, nine feet long. Um, yeah, but they're, like I say, one of eight, uh, including the leopard, the golden cat, the marbled cat, the fishing cat, and the baby jungle cat, which is the smallest. It's just slightly larger than a domestic cat. The way you read them out, they sounded like a set of collectibles. <laughs> <laughs> Collect them all. But yes, it is the Bengal tiger which catches everyone's imagination. Uh, they are huge. They can weigh up to 225 kilos, 500 pounds. They can run up to 60 kilometres an hour. That's 37 miles per hour. They have a bite force of up to 2,200 pounds per square inch. It's the strongest bite of any big cat in the world and is known to be able to bite through bones and even skulls. Yes. They're ambush predators. They're known for using stealth and uh, they will attack you quietly and quickly from behind or from the side so you don't really even see them before they're on top of you yeah during the victorian era it's estimated that tigers killed around 60 people a year a fatality rate estimated to be around 80 percent but i think we got a few more of them that of them than they got of us yeah certainly during the victorian era there were a lot of hunters out there uh, trying to get their skins today it's slightly different uh, only about 20 people a year are killed by tigers and that makes up just three percent of the tigers food requirements for the year i I don't think it's a requirement (laughs) (laughs) so one of the reasons why tigers are thought to attack humans in bangladesh is because of the many rivers that you spoke about pete uh, running through bangladesh apparently the tides come up quite high and because the tides come up they destroy the tiger's territorial markers things like urine and scat that's sort of left behind and so the tigers are trying to defend their territory, basically. Their territory is con- ah, in constant right. need no, of being sense. remarked. Their, their fence, their boundary fence has been washed away. Yeah, exactly. And so they're just constantly going around putting their, their fence back up. Uh, another reason, though, that they might attack humans, it's thought in Bangladesh in particular, is that because they've grown used to eating human flesh. Now, that's because dead bodies wash up on the shore due to the cyclones and floods, which impact Bangladesh every year, killing thousands of people. And the bodies drift through the swampy mangroves and the tigers just scavenge on those. So they've become accustomed to the taste of human flesh. Now, some local people are forced to go into the forest to collect firewood, honey or fish, and it's then that the uh, tigers will will pounce on them. Uh, They've even been known to swim out and attack fishermen in their boats, destroying the boats and attacking the fishermen inside. That's why I always travel with two juicy steaks. (laughs) Yeah. But as of June 2023, time of recording, there have been no recorded attacks this year in Bangladesh, which is good news. Uh, But in 2022, this time last year, a 27-year-old man called Kausar Gain, he was out collecting honey when he was attacked and killed by a tiger, his body found by officials the next day. In June 2022, a 45-year-old man called Nural Islam, he was killed by a tiger while fishing. And a month later, a 35-year-old woman called Rehana Katun. She was attacked by the same tiger while collecting water from a pond. Luckily, she was taken to hospital where they treated her injuries, but unfortunately, those injuries included deep scars across her back. Her arm is now disabled and she's lost an eye and her nose. Oh, my Lord. 
Interestingly, though, after attacks like this, the tigers in Bangladesh are no longer hunted and killed because of a government policy which says that tigers shouldn't be killed unless they pose an immediate threat to human life. So you can kill one if it's about to attack you, but you can't kill it after it's attacked you. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's fair enough. Yeah, me too. Instead, the tigers are now relocated to areas where they're less likely to come into contact with humans. But that hasn't reassured the local villagers, so they've started to release their livestock into the forest to provide the tigers with an alternative food source and sort of discourage them from coming into the villages. But yeah, given the size of tigers, you might think that humans stand no chance in a fight with a Bengal tiger. But in 2017, a man in Nepal killed a Bengal tiger after it attacked his livestock. He was herding his goats when the tiger attacked and it's said that he fought off the tiger and killed it with his bare hands. So do you want to hear a Bengal tiger roar? Oh, yeah. Yes, please. So quite scary. Yeah, that's not something you want to be uh, hearing moments before it attacks you. I think the bigger scary sound is the sound of the tiger that you can't hear. Is that like the sound of one hand clapping? It's like the sound of the tiger that's crouched in the bushes being very quiet. <laughs> Next to the hidden dragon. But I've got to say, they are very beautiful. They're amazing. Yes. To look at. Oh, they're glorious creatures, aren't they? I met very yeah. nice rugs. Boo! <laughs> <laughs> Pete, you should redeem yourself. Talk about the physicist. I haven't got anything on the physicist. That's going to have to be right. Well, actually, as it happens, I do have some stuff on the physicist. So we're talking about Sir Jagadish Chandra Bose, right? Absolutely. And I asked whether or not he was Bose of the Bose audio equipment. You know, all of the noise cancelling headphones and speakers and such. And it turns out that the electronics company Bose Corporation is not connected to Sir Jagadish Chandra Bose, as you rightly pointed out, Pete. So I was factually correct. We'll chalk that one up. <laughs> ah, but there were two physicists called Bose. Were there? Who was the other one? The one with Bose-Einstein condensate, which is a state of matter. So there you go. There is another Bose. Of course, you have bosons. So were bosons named after Bose? Oh. Like the Higgs boson. Yes, because a boson is a particle that has integral spin, spin of one or two or three or naught. And they have different properties to fermions, which have spins of half and three halves and five halves. I don't know what you're saying, but it sounds <laughs> impressive. Physics. More <laughs> physics. Further More physics. physics. <laughs> yeah. But look, yeah, so then I was curious about the Bose Corporation one. Why was it called Bose? Uh, well, it was named after its founder, uh, a guy called Amar Gopal Bose, who was born in November 2nd, 1929 in Philadelphia in the USA. His father was an Indian freedom revolutionary who studied physics in Calcutta when he was arrested and imprisoned for his opposition to British rule. And after being released, he fled from India to the United States, where he married an American school school teacher, and they had Amar Bose. So he showed an early interest in electronics as a young lad, and by the time he was 13, he actually set up a business fixing radios for like local shops and his neighbours and things. These people always make me feel so inadequate when I think about what I was doing at that age. It certainly right. wasn't that. <laughs> no, if somebody wanted to, you know, a badly put together Lego, I would have done it. <laughs> So he went on to earn a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a doctorate in electrical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the MIT. And he became so dissatisfied with high-end stereo systems that he had purchased that he began researching acoustics on his own in his own private time, basically in a way to try and improve the audio quality. And it was this research that led to the development of a new speaker design that replicated the experience of listening to music in a concert hall. And it was that development that that led to a series of patents, which he used to build a company, and he established it basically as a leader in audio equipment industry. Yeah, I could have done that. I just didn't want to. Yeah, he died in July 12th, 2013, and in his will, he donated the majority of his company's non-voting shares to MIT, with a stipulation that the shares should never be sold. And basically, that arrangement means that Bose Corporation remains privately owned, and that the dividends from the shares are then used to help support education and research at 
MIT. Oh, good on him. Another good Bose, because that uh, first Bose was excellent also. But nothing to do with the episode. You're just disappointed there's not enough physics. <laughs> but that's not your problem, is it? It's your problem, Pete. Say some physics words. I enjoy waves <laughs> and <laughs> amplitude. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And so we have come to the end of the line, Peter. It is time for you to step into the dock and prepare to face the people's judge. Can I not? Judge Dursley, are you ready to give your verdict? Yes, I am. I've been ready since 10 minutes into the episode. Okay, then. Will the defendant please rise? Yeah. Your Honour, as usual, may we start proceedings by first asking for your verdict on factual content. (laughs) Given the previous answers and the previous discussions, I can only give you a... D. Ouch. Yeah. I'm... Okay. <laughs> Did you hear the tone with which he said it, Pete? It was, I felt he felt he was being generous with the D, to be honest with you. <laughs> your Honour, then, may I ask for your verdict on entertainment value? Well, I'm afraid this is going to have to be low again, because one of the skits had a blatant inaccuracy in it as well. So, on that note, Peter, I shall give you C-. minus. It's almost a D, Peter. It's D proximate, isn't it? It is, yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. It's not a D. I was still thought it was going to be Ds across the board for a moment. Right, but this is the this is where things could pick up for you, Pete, because you did have a physicist in here. That's so, true. Your Honour, may I have your verdict on Dursley Factor? Well, this was an episode of two halves. Ah, as I said, after about ten minutes, I was shouting at the radio and then there were a couple of other things but then when you actually got into the intersection of Bangladesh and the Victorian era when you worked out what the Victorian era was but then you just reminded me that one of those people did their efforts outside the Victorian era so I'm going to have to recalibrate my score on the fly you don't have to recalibrate and it's perfectly calibrated quiet and cool <laughs> And so I would give the interest factor a C plus. Nice. C plus. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm happy with that. I'll take that with both hands and pack it away. OK, well, look, we have reached the final verdict. But before the judge passes his ruling, Peter, you now have an opportunity to enter a plea. If you choose to do so, please make that plea now. Well, I mean, what are facts? What is the truth anyway? What is real and what's not? So I think it deserves possibly an A. OK. <laughs> Enough of a plea. It wasn't much of a plea, was it? Well, Your Honour, the defendant stands before you. Have you reached a verdict? Yes, I have. In which case, I would ask most respectfully for your ruling. I'm afraid there were some unacceptable errors in this which should not have got past any triage, so, and I'm afraid your rather pathetic mitigation speech um, (laughs) has actually hardened me against you, Pete, so I'm going to give you D minus. Oh, Oh my gosh. Good Lord. You just got a slap round the backside, That was a real beatdown, wasn't it? That was a the Dursley beatdown. Crikey. Wow. Especially, I think that's that's called hubris, isn't it? Yeah, it had to happen eventually. I, I'll, I'll take my I'll take my licks like a man. Well, I enjoyed it. <laughs> you're going to play your sting again. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, look, there you go. 
Whew, that is the show for this week. If you'd like to get in touch about any of the things that we've talked about on this show or the main episode, or just to say hello, you can reach out to us on social media through our website at hhepodcast.com or by email at Pete and Ryan at hhepodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you, and you never know, you might end up featured on a future show. That's right, and one way to definitely feature on a future episode is to rate and review the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Your recommendation really does go a long way to help bringing the show to new listeners. Now, if you're on Mastodon, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, any of those, you can find us at HHE Podcast. And if you subscribe to them, you'll get an alert every time we post any of our trivia, photos, news, extra bits of information from the show. That's right. And we're going to be back again soon with our next episode, episode 75, Communism in Antarctica during the Triassic. Easy. <laughs> But in the meantime, a huge thank you to the judge himself. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. Well, not really after listening to that episode. (laughs) And that is it. I guess all that's left to say now is... You've been listening to... So, Pete, uh, you told us about the balls... I, yes, I was very much all about the balls. Yeah, the uh, wandering minstrels, the mystic musicians. The musical philosophers. And so I went on YouTube and I was sort of scrolling through the various balls. <laughs> 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 and so as I was scrolling through, I noticed that there were a lot of very modern balls. But then that got me thinking and I thought, well, OK, so well, what's the next generation? So I found three young balls that are going to be the next big thing. So the first one is Swati Sahar. Swati ball! (laughs) 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 I'm sorry, you can't call a Swati ball. (laughs) Did you think about that? Did you notice that? (laughs) No. <laughs> and next it was Jahangir Dangli. <laughs> <laughs> Dangly balls. Oh my god, I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to put this bit on the end. It'll make the episode seem incredibly long. <laughs> <laughs>